So let's go ahead and read that once again. It's Revelation chapter 3, guys. We're going to read verse 14 through 22, and then we'll jump right back into uh, where we left off. So this is the word, guys. It says, And to the angel of the church of the, of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's disgusting. Whenever it's lukewarm, it's disgusting. He's going to vomit out of the mouth because there's no decision making. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And I do not know and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, and that you may be rich, and that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be, um, that you may be, sorry, that you may be clothed, that, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with all salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. So we're going to go on, guys, on verse 18, where it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire. I counsel you. This is his instruction to the church that was lukewarm, that hadn't made a decision. He's saying, I want you now. I want to counsel you. I want you to buy from me the gold that's refined by fire. You know, when I heard that 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 phrase, I counsel you to buy for me. I automatically thought of the prophet Isaiah, guys, and I want to take you there real quick. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 and 2. This is what he says to the people of God. And it's the same concept. It says here, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. So this is the prophet Isaiah speaking to the people of Israel, speaking to us, the church. The same concept, the same idea that Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea. I counsel you to buy refined gold. In other words, what we have, guys, what we think is great and good, what we think can satisfy us, doesn't compare to what God has, guys. And I don't know, if you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. You know, let me tell you something, not even no spouse, no child, no money, no, no education, no, these all things are good. And I'm not saying they're not, but they cannot compare to what God can give you. You can have a, a great woman or a great man and still not be happy and still feel alone. There are people that are married and they still feel alone. Like, what? You're married. The, you know, you can have the best of the best. You can have all the money in the world and still feel unsatisfied, unhappy. Because let me tell you, only Jesus, guys, only Jesus can satisfy. So he's counseling them and saying, hey, you know, you think you have money. You know, you have the, the clothes, you know, you got the healing, the, the products for healing. You have all that, and that's all right, but that's not good enough. I'm the one that can give you what you're missing, what you're looking for, what you're desiring. Amen? Yeah, so he counsels them, guys, and tells them. And, of course, the things that he tells them are, are the things that we see here, which, again, is gold refined by fire, which means pure gold, white garments for their clothing to cover their shame. 
and an anointing for them to be able to see. Because that's what he speaks to them here. Again, going back to the things that they thought they had. Okay? Because God wants us to relate. Amen? So for us, it will be whatever fits in your shoes. Whatever you put first, you know, it can be your parents. Again, it can be whatever that you think is the best. Let me tell you, God says, I can give you more. I can give you what you're looking for. Amen? So that's what he counsels them at first. Then we go to verse 19, guys. Verse 19. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So as many as I love, I rebuke. As I mentioned from the beginning that I was going to mention to you a little bit about love and how we sometimes misinterpret love. And we feel that love is just the ooey gooey uh, feeling that we get when somebody hugs us and says you're the best or gives you a kiss and I love you. And we feel so warm and so satisfied by that feeling that we get uh, affirmation, acceptance, you know, whatever. And it, th this is part of love. Yes, definitely. That is part of love. But the flip side of that, guys, is that there is a rebuke as well. And there's a chastening, guys. There's a chastening. And I think it's important that we see this. You know, of course, to some of we think like, man, I don't know about you, but I didn't get spanked too much, but I did. And when I did, I remember thinking like, and they would tell me that they love me like, Charlie, I, well, don't love me. If, you, if this is love, <laughs> don't love me like that, you know. We didn't understand that love. We didn't understand. Of course, now that we're older, now that we have our own kids, we understand the principle that if we don't teach them these principles, well, then, of course, uh, they're going to learn it some other way. But anyway, this is God, guys. And, and, and this is, you know, his understanding that, you know, guys, that he, if he loves us, he is going to step before you and, and tell you something. He's going to rebuke you. He's going to chase in you. Hebrews chapter 12, guys, um, I don't have it here in my notes, but Hebrews chapter 12, if you look at Hebrews 12, it says that, you know, any if, if you are his son, I'm paraphrasing this, but if you're his son or, or you're his daughter, well, guess what? You, you're going to get scourged. You're going to get rebuked. You're going to get chased and you're going to get scourged. You are. And, you know, when I thought about that, I thought about um, – I've, I've mentioned this before as an example, you know, McDonald's or any place that you go, you know, and there's a lot of kids running around and doing all these things. Uh, you re you don't get after those kids that are running around if they're not your kids, right? Usually you don't, right? Sometimes God gives us the grace to do that, <laughs> you know, but usually you don't because then some parent might say, hey, what's up, man? They, what, you got a problem or what, you know? Um, but you will do, you will get after your kid. If your kids are running around, you're like, get over here. And so, and that's the same principle, guys. If you're a child of God, if you're a daughter of God, well, guess what? And you're doing something that's not right. He's going to do something. He's going to, and, and that's an evidence, guys. Really, that is evidence that we're saved. So if you've never got a rebuke, if you've never been chasing or scorched, then you need to become a child of God tonight. <laughs> You need to repent from your sins and come to him and be reborn again. Again, guys, you see, I think maybe that's why a lot of people don't come on Wednesdays no more because this is kind of hard. You know what I'm saying? Who wants to hear this? But it's the real deal, guys. It is the truth of his word. And it speaks to us and helps us to understand many times. So check this out, guys. Rebuke, chasten, and scourge. So I'm going to break that down just so you can understand how he works, guys. So the rebuke, guys, of course, the rebuke in the setting of in a home and a father, mother, you know, uh, disciplining their, their kids. It, it would be something like in Spanish, we'll, be, we'll say something like, aplacate, aplacate, niño. Like, behave, behave. I'm already telling you, you better stop. You better stop because you're acting very silly or very disrespectful. That is the rebuke, guys. God will speak, and you know what? He'll speak through his word. He'll speak through his word. You get up in the morning, you read a scripture, and then he speaks to you through a scripture. And, ah, he'll speak to you through a minister, through me. 
through your leader, somebody who's teaching the word. He'll speak through you through them. He'll speak through you through his spirit. The spirit of God will be an alarm to you and say, hey, you know you shouldn't be doing that. You need to stop right now. You know what I'm saying? Again, if you're a child of God, these are things that are going to happen, guys. These are things that are going to happen. Why? Because he loves us. It's not that he, he hates us and he wants to stop us from our, our, our freedom. And, you know, actually you're going to be become a slave to whatever you're in. So he doesn't want you to be the slave. So he's going to speak something and say, hey, hold up. Wait a minute. Put some Jesus in it. You know what I'm saying? Hold up. Wait a minute. Put some Jesus in it. So he'll rebuke you. Boom with the word. The second one is pretty interesting, and I, I feel that I've experienced, I think, all, definitely all three. <laughs> but the, sh the chastening is something like this. The chastening is more of an emotional discipline. So let's break it down in the home setting. We're eating, and everybody's eating there at the table, and it feels good because it's family time, and we're eating. But the chavalon is acting nasty, man. And you told him already, stop. Stop the rebuke. The rebuke, stop. And he did, they continue. Go to your room. Go to your room. That's the chastening. That is now an emotional discipline where, you know, they didn't hear the word. Now, now you're going to be, be able to be part of the family gathering right now. You need to go to your room and think about what you're doing and saying and acting. So go over there. Can you, can you hear an Amen. Amen. I don't know if you, so how does that look like as a Christian? Sometimes you can be at church and still feel miserable. Could it be God saying, hey, well, you're not doing the work because you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing. And you're here, and it's okay, but emotionally here, you don't have the joy, the peace, the love. You don't have that going on because you're not living a right life. Emotional discipline, a chastening. The last one is the scourging, guys. You know, so we looked at in the setting of a home is that after you send the kid to his room and he continues and then no other, he's slamming the door. <laughs> he's slamming the door. He's making all kinds of noises. Oh, boy. And then you go in there. Come here, boy. What are you doing? The scourging. Now there is some affliction. Affliction, guys. There is some affliction. I mean, this can be, you know, when we look at in the, in the church of the Corinthians, guys, and you remember whenever they did the, uh, the communion, the communion that we do every, every month. We do the communion, the bread, the, the you know, the, the little cracker and then the little cup, the juice representing the blood and the body of Jesus. The Bible says, guys, that some of these people drank the communion in an unworthily manner, meaning they were wrong. So God had already rebuked them and said, you better put your life in order. Uh, God had already chastened them. They probably weren't feeling it all in, but they were still there at church. But they still didn't heed to it, the rebuke of the chastening. And the Bible says, guys, this is not what I say, but the Bible says that many of them were sick. They were sick. Because they were doing things that they were supposed to do. And many fell asleep. Meaning they passed away, guys. Yikes. Help us, Lord. Okay, let's change the subject. <laughs> no, no. So you, you see what I'm saying, guys? You, you have to understand. This is his love. Look at, guys. If... if Let's put a setting in your home, guys, that you don't tell your kids anything. Somebody is. And they're not going to do it in a good way. You are going to love them. Even if you hit them, you're going to hit them with a lot of love. I mean, I know you're not going to be like, oh, I love you, baby. Like, <laughs> you're, you're not going to be like that, yes. But you're going to try to hit them in the buttocks. You know what I'm saying? You're going to try to hit them where there's more cushion. You're going to. If, if they have to learn it out there, they're going to hit him in the face. They're going to hit him in the stomach. They're, you know what I'm saying? He's going to go to prison, and they're going to beat him up over there. You know, it, it's going to be rough and tough. No love at all, guys. 
So we teach them so they can learn a better path. That is God because he loves us. He's going to deal with us, deal with us until, you know, until, you know, if you're saved, you, you'll get it. You'll get it. If you're not saved, Rom Romans chapter 1, check this out. And this is not even my message, but Romans chapter 1 says this, guys, okay? Romans chapter 1, this is like, this is the worst. You know why it, there's good right now? Because God is here in this world, guys. Yeah, there's a lot of evil, right? It's crazy stuff in this world, man. So much hurt, pain, the flesh. And that's normality because sin and because the devil's out here as well. Let me tell you something. But whenever we leave, when the rapture comes, guys, and the great tribulation comes, God's not going to be here. And all hell's going to break loose. And that's why they say there's not going to be that setting of what's going to take place cannot be compared to anything that has happened in this world. Even, you know, with Adolf Hitler killing all these m millions of Jewish people and kids. and I mean, everything. I mean, it's going to be so crazy. And, and so, so you think about it. The reason why it's not so chaotic is because God is still here. But one day, he, the Bible says, even in Re going back to Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that he lets these people go. He goes, though they knew me, they didn't acknowledge me. And so he says, you know what? I'll let them to do whatever they want. And that is like damnation, guys. If you don't have no one telling you anything and leaving your life to yourself, you're in a road going straight to that brick wall. He loves us. Therefore, he rebukes and he chastens. Amen? Check this out. That word love in the Greek is not the agape love, guys. It is the phileo love, okay? So, of course, if you know a little bit of the Greek, when it comes to love, it's phileos agape, agape which is unconditional love. Phileos, which is a friendship love. Uh, and then eros, which is a romantic love and a marriage love. This is the phileo love, guys, right here, which means, he, which means this. He, uh, even though he rebukes us and chases, chases, chastens us, he's still our friend. He's still our friend. It doesn't matter how far you fall. I'm still your friend, and I will do whatever it takes to get you back on track. That's a friend, guys. Remember Proverbs 27, 6, pay for the wounds of a friend. A real friend is going to tell you what's up. Really, guys, if you don't have people in your life to tell you what's up, you better be careful, man. You better be careful. If you don't have anybody to tell you, hey, hold up, pump the brakes right there. I'm always a bad guy. Me, I'm always a bad guy. I'm always a bad guy. But I'm a friend. I'm a friend. I'm sorry. Maybe a lot of people might not want me around. <laughs> but I'm a friend. I'm going to tell you what's up. Because I love you. That is God. So he loved and so much to rebuke and chase him. Amen. And what he tells them, guys, he wants them to repent, guys. Right? So let's look at that one more time. It says, this wind blew it off. Okay. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. Therefore, be zealous and repent. That word zealous in the Greek as well means to be hot, to be passionate for God. Be zealous for God. So he's saying, hey, be zealous, be hot, repent, turn your way. If you're doing wrong, turn, learn the lesson, learn the lesson of what God is trying to speak into your life, guys. Can I hear amen? Is this for me only or do you understand? I mean, can you relate? All right. So check this out. Then he goes on to say, we're almost done right here. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We read that scripture many times, right? Beautiful scripture. I mentioned to you guys, it's interesting, right, that in this church, Jesus is outside. He's knocking and he wants to come into the church. And that's very interesting because the church is his body. In other words, he's supposed to be in here. He's supposed to be the head of this church. But in this church... He's outside and saying, hello, 
can I come in? <laughs> That's amazing. This church was very far away from God. God wasn't even in it, guys. Let me break this down real quick because I really like it, guys. I put here, but notice Jesus is outside the church. In other words, uh, this is for us also, guys, in a personal way. We are the church. But you can be into Jesus, but Jesus doesn't mean is in you. Because the church was playing a part that it was all Jesus in there. But Jesus wasn't even in there. And that's the same in our life, guys. We can claim to be hallelujah, Jesus. And we can claim it. And you can be all into Jesus. You, you see the Jesus church and everything. No. That's really community church. You know, we're using it. But we can be on to Jesus. But if Jesus is not in you. He's knocking. He's knocking. John 15, verse 5, guys. Chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Check this out. He who abides in me and I in him. He who abides in me and I in him. He who abides in me and I in him. It's a reciprocal relationship. It's not a one-way thing. It's not just about me and God. God has to be in me, meaning he is Lord of my life. He, I do what he wants me to do. He's everything to me. You hear what? He says, if that's the case, okay, then you're going to bear a lot of fruit. He says, because if not, you can't do nothing. Can't do nothing. Doesn't matter. Amen. Check this out, guys. So the Bible says, I stand. I stand. What does it mean to stand? What does it mean that Jesus is standing? Meaning that he's waiting long at the door of the sinner's heart. He knocks using judgments, mercies, reproofs, exhortation to induce sinners to repent and turn to him. So he stands there waiting. He stands there. Exhortation. He's encouraging you. Mercies. Judgments come at times your way. And he's knocking reproofing you. Hey, get it back, man. This is what you got to do. He's knocking. He's knocking, knocking. He wants us to repent, guys. He lifts up his voice, and I like this. He says, behold, I knock on the door. If anyone hears my voice, this is powerful. This is powerful. This is beautiful. He lifts up his voice. He calls loudly by his word, ministers, and his spirit, I, as I just mentioned. Check this out. The key is to hear his voice. That's the key, guys. So he's knocking, again, using mercies. Every time there's a mercy, you know it, sh it should have, you know you should have got pulled over. You know, you know, you should have, something should have happened to you. You should have got fired. But mercies, mercy, he's knocking. It was God. It was God. It was God. It was God. You're down and now. God sends somebody your way and, and makes your face light up because it, he encouraged you. That was God. That was God. You wanted to give it up already. And God sent somebody out of nowhere. It was God. He's knocking. But check this out, guys. The key is to hear his voice. Before, behold, I knock at the door. If anyone hears my voice, if you and I can give attention to what he is saying, that is opening your door. That right there. If you can understand that mercy was given to you. You should have not got that job. But mercy was given to you. You need to realize if you're not living right, God is speaking to you and saying, hey, get it right. The voice, that voice is what's important. Yes, the mercy is the knock, but the voice that comes in and says, man, I need to get my life back on track. You know you're not living it right. That voice right there is what leads you to repentance, guys. It's what opening the door to Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? Come on. I think I'm, I'm preaching good today. I'm preaching good. I'm bringing the points across. This is important, guys. So he's knocking. But the voice that you're hearing, put it together. Get it right. Start doing what you need to be doing. You know that's the voice. And that's what we need to hear. When we heed to that voice, we open the door, guys. We open the door. He will come in and dine with him. That's, that's what the scripture says. Okay? Check this out. Not only come in, but dine with him. This meal spoke of a specific meal, guys. Okay? And I forgot, I, I mentioned this. It's a Greek word, diopronon. 
But this was a meal that the Jewish people did, guys, and it was the important meal of the day, the biggest meal of the day, guys. So check this out. When they did this meal, guys, it was a relaxed setting. It wasn't a snack. This is where we're going to kick off our tree, and we're going to relax. We're going to chop it up, guys. We're going to be there two or three hours, and we're going to eat, but we're going to talk. That was this meal in the Jewish tradition, and that is what Jesus was talking about. I want to dine with you. I don't want to just go to McDonald's and pick it up and let's go and back. No, no, let's go to, you know, Longhorn Steakhouse. Let's go to, let's go to a place where we're going to relax and we're going to sit down and we're going to fellowship. That is what God is wanting, guys. He wants fellowship. Check this out. It's crazy. This church was the craziest church, guys. But look at his heart. After the fact that he said, you're lukewarm and I'm going to vomit you. Even after all that, he's rebuking them and he's chasing them. But all with the desire that he wants fellowship with this church. He wants fellowship with this church. He wants to have a relationship with this church. Oh, man, that's pretty awesome, guys. I'm almost done, guys. Five minutes. The scripture says, behold, I knock on the door. Check this out. If anyone, if anyone. If anyone hears my word. This is interesting because it's not now a corporate thing. It's an individual thing. If anyone. So he's not telling the church, hey, church, I'm, I'm knocking at, at your door here, church, all of us. No, no, no. Who is he speaking to tonight? It's, it's individual. It's not about your neighbor. You see, because this is what happens sometimes when we're at church. We're at church and we think, you know, man, the pastor's speaking or whoever's up here speaking. Hey, man, that word right there is for over there, man. He's letting them have it. He's, you know, I know what he's doing and she's doing Jesus. It's over there. But that's not the way it works. God's word is for us. And that's why he says, behold, I knock at the door. If anyone, anyone. Here's my voice. Then he's going to come in and dine with him. So, so check this out. Why, why not the church, guys? Why not come and get to know him more? Because that's not the way God works. He's a very personal God, and it's a very individual thing when it comes to God. And God knows, guys, that if each one of us can start coming to God, the whole church turns to God. It's one, by, it's one at a time. It's one at a time. That's what this church is all about. It's about winning souls one at a time. I'm not going to win 3,000 souls at one time. If God gives it to me and gives me the privilege to do that, praise the Lord. But let me tell you something. Until then, it's one soul at a time. It's one soul. You turn from your ways. And then the other one will turn from their ways. And then the other one. And by the time you know it, we're going to have a very pure church, guys. Because we're all turning from our ways. That's what he's speaking about. And I finish with this. Verse 21 says this. To him who overcomes. To him. Now again, this church is the worst church, guys. But check this out. There's overcomers in this church. To him who overcomes. That's what I put here. I put It's interesting. This was the worst church out of the sample. But in Jesus, they first can overcome. Right? They're overcomers. So no matter how far... And ugly we get, God, we can overcome in God when we come to God. He goes on to say this, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I have overcome and sat with my father on his throne. The worst church, but the greatest privilege. What? These Laodiceans, these lukewarm, that I'm going to vomit, vomit you out of my mouth, people can, can change and if you change, you, you're going to overcome. You're going to be a winner, not a loser. And then you can sit at, with my, in my throne as well. Wow. That is God, guys. That is awesome. Now, he finished as he finished with all the other churches. He who has an ear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches, guys. Man, we, we've gone through, what, a whole month talking about these letters. Every church, he says, he who has an ear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. 
The word is spiritual, guys. God is speaking to your heart, not to your head. This is what he wants. The change doesn't happen here. It happens here. He's speaking to us. Now, wherever you find yourself throughout all these on these seven churches, or even this church here, guys, heed the word of God, guys. He's calling you. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to walk the walk, not to be lukewarm, but to be hot for him, guys, passionate for him, serving him wholeheartedly, guys, having a relationship, not just coming to church Sundays and Wednesdays. That really is a miserable life, guys. It's a life that we live with him every single day, guys. It's a beautiful life. That's what he wants. Let's stand.